Well, good morning, everybody. My sincere thanks to Dr. Vitul for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be here amongst you and to be talking uh, on the topic, which is, uh, I think, we all get involved with it. It because geriatric medicine in India is not a separate medicine; it is the part of our reg regular curriculum. So it may be elderly. So we all are actually, as the age is advancing because we are treating more and more elderly patients because the uh, in age is now increasing. So it is approach to a patient in coma, especially an elderly patient. And when we say coma, it means a total absence of arousal. By definition, it means that it is the absence of arousal and awareness which is lasting for at least one hour and associated with injury or functional disruption of the ascending reticular activating system in the brainstem or bilateral cortical structures. And it is absolutely an unarousable and a state of unresponsiveness. The pupillary reactions, the reflex ocular movements, the corneal and the brainstem reflexes, they are preserved but to a varying degree. And respiration may be slow, rapid or periodic. So the initial management of a comatosed patient, it involves the same steps which are needed to manage a critically ill geriatric patient or any other patient who is presenting in the emergency. The first more Im most important things when we receive a patient in the triage or in the emergency is to support A, B, C. The airway is the first thing. So immediately, if the patient is gasping or if the patient is res respiration is SpO2 is less and you think that the patient needs a ventilator, first of all, you know, you need to support the airway, first of all. Have a look at it. Does the patient need the support to the airway? If he doesn't, it's okay. But if he needs, breathing is the first thing which needs to be established because he may have aspirated and immediate suction by the endotracheal intubation and of course the ventilation if required. Then is the, the to correction of the shock. Then you have to see for the cardiac. If the patient is in shock, second step is immediately you take an IV excess and then you have to ascertain the cause of the shock quickly. Is it hypovolemic, rush in the fluids uh, and simultaneously you start the inotropes and now this is the time that you start taking the history regarding the cause, the time of unconsciousness, any history of trauma, tra history of the past diseases, which is very, very important. Why I put the history in the, later in the position? Because first thing is to support the airway, the breathing, and then now we have an IV excess, and now we can, you know, now this is the time to actually get to the patient. If trauma has occurred, you have to check for the wounds, for the bleeding, for the head, or for the head injury. Quick look at the abdomen if you feel a liver or spleen could have been ruptured. A quick ultrasound examination is also a part of the, in the emergency uh, to rule out any, any uh, um, hydrothorax or to rule out any fluid in the abdomen and also to look for the cervical spine injury and also now most important in our area of the Punjab you, we all encounter intoxications most of our patients when they can't breathe our first diagnosis is actually a drug abuse that is most of us I think you all agree with me whenever you think the patient is gasping he's not breathing properly we know either it's a pukki or an opium or a multiple drug abuser or a IV heroin or something that the patient has taken now considering the age that that is how you will come to your diagnosis if it's an old patient maybe not an IV heroin maybe opium or if it's a case of drug intoxication so history is of a paramount importance and uh, you can take the direct from the direct interrogation from the family, from the observers, from the ambulance technician, person who's brought the patient to you. And these days, you know, many times we have to rely on the telephone because 
Mo the attendant may be at home and somebody else may have picked up the patient and sometimes the patient because of the nuclear families the usually the person who lives with the family may not have come with the patient so important symptoms the circumstances where was the patient last seen what happened what was the event did the patient had seizure no seizure and the rapidity of the neurological symptoms this is very important and the antecedent symptoms was there any confusion was there any pre ictus was there any weakness any headache any fever and what were the kind of seizures what actually happened during the seizures I often tell my patients you know you make videos of everything so it is most important is to make a video of how did the patient pass out at that time and make a video of the what was happening at that time was it a seizure or not a seizure and then the medications which are extremely important you know uh, the abusing drugs and the alcohol and opium is separate but whatever medications a geriatric patient had been taking because I think today I know of no patient who will come to you and had not been on any medication and he is an old patient considering the incidence of diabetes and hypertension the incidence of anti-diabetic medications patients going into hypoglycemias and patient on chlorthalidon or on hydrochlorothiazide coming to us with severe hyponatremias and metabolic encephalopathies so these diseases their histories and the use of these medications now it is very important that we always tell the attendants that you bring whatever medicine the patient has been taking because otherwise it is impossible to guess what the patient had been taking I had a young boy eight year old boy who was brought unconscious this is apart from the geriatric uh, medicine which we are discussing the patient was unconscious looking at it we did got the blood sugars done which were 30 the patient is a non-diabetic eight year old child what is happening I told them you bring what were you giving any medication yes the child was having a uh, nocturia and uresis the doctor had put him on medication bring bring the medication to me the doctor had prescribed him Depsonil but the chemist had those days given him Dionel so the child had gone into hypoglycemia so ask the patient or the attendants to bring the used or the unused medications with them or even if they have the you know the prescription from the doctor if we are able to read the prescription sometimes we may not be able to read so uh, then is the emergency test we are right now standing in the emergency we have just stabilized the patient and we have just taken the history we've just done the breathing and the IV access now what next I want to do the three tests I want to do rapidly in the emergency is the blood sugar ABG and electrolytes these are the most important tests which I would want to do in the triage in the emergency at that very moment because correction of hypoglycemic coma is so wonderful so rewarding and similarly is the correction of hyponatremia or hypokalemia and then hypoxia also we have been now basically all COVID trained and we know that oxygen therapy or the correction of hypoxia is is so much needed and it is it is the you know so much required immediately and the patients who been taking IV heroin or IV uh, or use of opium naloxone once the you have stabilized the breathing can help us for the patient to rapidly come out of the overdose and in alcoholics thiamine does help them to come out of the vernic vernix encephalopathy so the cause of unconsciousness can be a convulsion can be a convulsion which may be a non convulsive seizures and then of course now we are we have been taken the history now we are at the physical examination look for any bitten tongue urinary incontinence or a elevated CPK M CPK knack this may happen in a seizure so the presence of small clonic or myoclonic convulsive movements status epilepticus or the patient had had a non convulsive status or a spike wave stupor which may be the cause the patient you know sometimes the, the thing is they uh, the convulsion may not have been observed by any but then 
uh, towards paralysis, then you wait for some time and see if the patient is coming out of it and how long the patient is taking to come out of it. And a quick CT scan examination is very, very important. If you are in a center which is enabled with CT scan, a, then once you have these much tests, you're quite done with your diagnosis. You have had a physical exam, a quick CT, and a rapid battery of tests. By this time, you will be able to reach your conclusion. You know, all this time you had the differential. Now you, you are very nearing the diagnosis, correct diagnosis. So then we have to just, because we need to differentiate whether it's a metabolic cause or it's a structural cause. So metabolic cause, of course, as we've just been discussing, it is just going to need supportive care. And then if there are infections, are then most important to after metabolic is the structural causes. There may be SOLs in the brain. That's why I said a quick CT scan, because CT scan doesn't take longer. It just takes three minutes to do a CT if you are in a facility which is enabled by a CT scan. So it will give you a quick diagnosis if is there a surgical cause, was there a bleed, was there a chronic subdural hematoma, is there a subarachnoid hemorrhage, is there a tumor, is there a hemorrhage in the tumor. So these are the things we will come to know immediately. And now uh, the first thing as we were talking about the metabolic causes, I already said, you know, in our area in Punjab, we all are practicing here and we all encountered IV heroin, chitta, smack, alcohols, barbiturates, sedative drugs, opiates, pukki, organophosphorus every day. And uh, this also, if it is a spray poisoning or organophorus, uh, or non organophosphorus these days we've had different kind of suicidal poisonings, you know. Paraquit is coming now more and more uh, using, people are using it more and more and patient may present to you with paraquit poisoning as well. So the uh, metabolic disturbances, now we have diagnosed, is it hypoxia, is it CO carbon monoxide poisoning? Uh, I, I think we all are also aware with the gas geyser poisonings also because in Punjab there is a rampant use of gas geysers which we all have been time and again telling all the media rather than to put any negative news, why don't you make the patients aware about non-use of gas geysers because they really kill people so fast that the person in the washroom does not get time to unbolt himself or to even change himself. The hypoxia at that time and the carbon monoxide, it is the rapidity to which the, it kills, I think it is the fastest. Because the moment they break open the door, the patient is already brought dead to the hospital. And the only lucky ones, if they are able to come to the hospital, they are 100% survivals because they are out of that environment and then you give them oxygen and you treat them, so that's 100%. So the credit of gas geyser treatment actually goes to the attendant who is quick to recognize and bring the patient quickly out of the washroom. And uh, then for diabetic patients, we have to be very careful. Is it hypoglycemia? Is hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma? Is it diabetic ketoacidosis? Is it uremic encephalopathy? Is it hyponatremia with dehydration? And many of our patients actually had been abusing steroids. And then, because they are steroid abuser, they go to the consultants and all of them, all of us, we tell them, oh, why are you taking steroids? The, if they're taking on their own, you are abusing steroids. So they suddenly would stop using steroid and they go to extent of going into Edison's crisis, which is iatrogenic, and then profound nutritional deficiency. Heat stroke, I think for last five, six years, we haven't seen any heat stroke patients in Punjab, but five, six years, I, I think around 10 years back, when there was this heat wave, heat strokes were very, very common. And they were especially common with the people who were coming from abroad, directly taking the flight and then coming on the way by the bus, on their halfway through into the bus, they were falling, uh, getting dehydrated and they were get, uh, you know, getting unconscious with the heat strokes. 
Well, thyroid status also needs to be checked because it includes Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Hepatic causes, Wernicke's encephalopathy due to severe alcoholism. It is again, you know, where the patient is. Uh, the patient could be agitated, the patient could be unconscious because of a severe, you know, he's recently abused so much of alcohol, then he's coming out in an agitated stress, then he's going into hepatic encephalopathy. And one big cause, and cause which I have recently realized, you know, severe constipation in the Pukki patients or in patients old age, when they have severe constipation, like for three, four days or they have been operated, we've been checking their ammonia levels and even simple constipation, ammonia level goes high and they've been going into unconsciousness. This uh, we have also realized that if you're not able to find anything, do check their ammonia levels. It may be a female which probably been constipated and now she's gone knee surgery and you are called by the orthopedician why the patient is gone unconscious, the CT is normal, blood pressure is controlled, diabetes is controlled. What cause came out was the hyperammonia and the deranged sensorium because of that. And as we've already said, now the infections, you know, they're very, very common. CT may be normal, but then now you think, you know, you are in the next, your all investigations were normal. You got a count which is slightly higher or maybe normal, but now you need to do a lumbar puncture, CT is normal. So you may be now encountering a patient of a bacterial or a viral or a fungal meningitis or a typhoid encephalopathy or a cerebral malaria or septicemic or viral encephalopathy or a neoplastic or paraneoplastic meningitis. Now uh, structural causes, CT scan gives you a wonderful information about all the structural causes for the head trauma, for the hemispherical hemorrhages, for massive infarctions, for old infarctions, for a brainstem infarction, for brain abscesses, subdural empyma, epidural, subdural hemorrhage, brain contusion, as well as cerebellar and pontine hemorrhages, or subarachnoid hemorrhage, a ruptured AVM or a ruptured aneurysm, the uh, CT scan, and MRI may be further, it is if, if required, but otherwise for the patient you receive unconscious so so much of information has been given to you by within five minutes by the CT scan. So that's the what is the role of the vital signs you know never forget we say as a clinician what is most important was the history the general physical examination and the vital signs they are most most important because they give you so much of information the, you make your quick diagnosis because of the vital signs. Hence, it is very, very important an accurate core temperature. Only then you will be able to see it's hypothermia or it is stroke. Now, the cause of hypothermia could be a severe sepsis. You know, old patients, no fever. The patient still may be septicemic. Hypothyroidism or a patient who is having hypoglycemia may be cold and clammy. And the patient who is brought to you maybe not in Punjab or in a very, very cold weather, we did have been receiving beggars from the road who are brought unconscious and they are severely suffering from hypothermia. And if the patient is hyperthermic, uh, if the temperature is more than 40 degree, hyperparexia may be suggestive of CNS infection, septicemia, a serotonin syndrome, a neuroleptic malignant syndrome, heat stroke, thyrotoxicosis, or even exposure to certain toxins such as salicylates, anticholinergics, sympathomimetics. I think all of us have a lot of experience using anticholinergic drugs, atropine, in our organophosphorus poisoning. And we know that all of these patients, we stop the atropine or we decrease the atropine when once the patient is fully atropinized and a temperature is one of the indicator when we want to decrease the dose or stop the use of atropine in our treatment of OP poisoning patients. An accurate blood pressure monitoring, nothing can replace it because a high systolic or diastolic measurement may indicate it's intracranial hemorrhage or even an infarction, thyrotoxicosis or exposure to some pathomimetic drugs. 
So bradycardia may be suggestive of increased intracranial pressure, hypothyroidism or the patients who are on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. And tachycardia may be seen with psychotropic drugs, ketamine intoxication, adrenergic hyperactivity or even with intracranial hemorrhages. Now coming to the respiration, we are on the vital signs. So that's very, very important because that's the first thing I said, breath of the patient. See, manage the breath of the patient because if you're managing the breath, I mean, that's the first and the last thing to do. Breath, because that's it. If you are breathing, you are live. If you're not breathing, you're not live. So it may suggest poisoning and like the, you know, fetal hepaticus from a patient who is in a hepatic encephalopathy, a uremic smell of a patient of a uremic encephalopathy, acetone, patient who is having ketosis in the breath and alcohol, and a very slow breathing is of suggestive of a patient of an opiate. It's like a slow respirate patient would say, patients. they're snoring, they're actually not snoring. When you see, they're actually, it's loud, slow breathing which can be seen because of a sedative or a hypnotic poisoning and a rapid respiratory breathe which the patient you see the chest is normal but the patient is patient is tachypnic you auscultated the chest a normal chest and a tachypnic tachypnic patient always think of hypoxia metabolic acidosis and ketoacidosis these three things always remember so chain stroke breathing is actually the pattern of a periodic breathing with phases of hyperapnea leading to apnea. And the presence of chain stroke breathing in a comatose patient, it implies bilateral dysfunction of cerebral hemisphere or the diencephalon. So now we, after these vital signs, now we're looking at the patient with patient fully exposed. You have to look for the cyanosis at any time you have to look, even if the patient is on ventilator, if the patient had aspirated, he may have a blocked endotracheal tube. So at any time you must keep looking at the exposed patient, the pallor, any needle tract signs, the patients we, we know have intravenous abuses would have nasal, uh, sorry, with the needle tracts, uremic frost, icterus, petechies, maybe sign of meningococcemia or a dengue shock syndrome, or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, well, not in our area. And what we see most common is the erythematous bluish spots for a very fragile skin on patients, old patients, especially on the ladies, is because of the use of the steroids, which was recommended or not recommended. Overuse, I would say. Any overuse is, can be called as abuse. So this is you looking at the hyperemia, the trauma, the petechial spots on the leg, and the cyanosed patient with bulbous eyes. It even shows indication of right ventricular uh, failure. So must always do a head examination in a, in a patient of a trauma. Look for CSF rhinorrhea, otorrhea, or mastoid ecchymosis, any depressed skull fractures. So any evidence of shunt placement, once you examine the patient, you examine the neck, you, you want to look at the lymph nodes, but you may actually see a shunt. And fundoscopic examination, which is usually not possible, may not be done if you have a CT scan. If you are fond of doing, you may see papilledema. So a neurological examination is entirely different in a normal awake person as compared to a person who is in coma. What you want to see here is posture. How is the patient lying? It, does he look normal? or does he not look normal? Mental status examination in a comatose patient, it is actually the assessment of the patient to the auditory, visual, and the noxious stimuli. Because CNS examination will be entirely different. This is how you're going to see the posture. The posture, the, that is the extension posturing that we call a decerebrate rigidity. It is the patient, the whole of the body is lying in a position of ophisthotonus. And this is the abnormal flexion of the, of, the, of the upper arms and the knees 
and the ankles they're rotating inwards which could be the decorticate rigidity so decorticate rigidity could be a sign of cerebral white matter or the lesion at the thalamus while a decerebrate rigidity could be a lesion at the brain stem or the intercollicular level so then we can have a look at the pupils and pupillary abnormalities they can suggest you the intracranial cause for the coma a unilaterally fixed dilated pupil will be a sign of the brain stem herniation with the causative mass lesion on the same side and then you have the CT scan to give you the information and pinpoint pupils could both sides could be because of the use of the opioids or pontine lesions and then you see the eye movements like what we all call as a doll eye movements they are the cornerstone of a neurological examination of a, of a comatosed patient so they can be assessed by activating certain reflexes you you rove the patient's head right to left and do they move conjugately if they move doll eye movements present then the brainstem is intact and if the persistently adducted eye adducted that means your same side abducent nerve is gone while uh, abducted eye indicates that the third eye the third cranial nerve that is gone so a doll eye movement may be suppressed in an awake patient one present they indicate an intact brain stem pathways and absence of doll eye movements would uh, indicate a significant damage in the brain stem which may be because of the drug overdose and a normal pupillary size and light re reaction distinguishes from a drug induced to a structural brain stem damage that's how we do the neuro uh, the doll eye movements test in a comatose patient then i said labs the ct scan or mri would be able to give you so much of information about chronic subdural hematoma and if it is normal you can go ahead with the lumbar puncture if required and your lab your cbc abg kft electrolytes blood sugar hba1c and particularly if you are thinking of any overdose of anticonvulsants opiates diazepines barbiturates or alcohol you may get it done you may now get acetone urea or blood ketones or urine ketones also so abg and uh, usually electrolytes are given by the same machine you know and there's the quick test which we do in our icus and they will give you a quick information of the hypoxia of the acid base balance disorder so bilateral hemisphere infarction acute brainstem infarction encephalitis meningitis mechanical shearing of axons or closed head trauma or sagittal sinus thrombosis or a subdural hematoma which is isodense or adjacent to brain these are some of the disorders that may not be picked up by the ct scan so if your ct scan is normal do always think of if your history or examination do as in the patient have a could the patient have a bilateral brain infarction brain stem infarction or encephalitis or meningitis or a closed hem hematoma or a isodense hemorrhage or a sagittal sinus thrombosis because these are the things which a ct scan will be missing so you have to correlate it with the history and with other findings if you think these could be the possibilities so eeg in unconscious patient is rarely diagnostic but if it is a seizure give time because ictus eeg will not give you any information it is only a post ictal eeg which will give you the information that the, it was a seizure so a predominant high voltage slowing is typical of a metabolic coma as a fast beta activity and an alpha coma which is 8 to 12 hertz it will indicate a diffuse cortical damage and which is any diffuse cortical damage is actually associated with a poor prognosis lumbar puncture as i said is the next investigation when you want to diagnose meningitis or encephalitis and then how do we grade the coma gcs we all have been grading it 
EVM, your eye movements and your verbal scoring and the, the scoring of the motor movements, total score is 15 points and you give grading according to those. There is another grading system which is called the full-time outline of unresponsiveness. G GCS 15 point and the full-time or outline scoring system is out of the 16 point scale. Both rely on the same, uh, but there is slightly higher inter-rater reliability, but both can be performed. So as I said, EVM and EVM 15 is a fully conscious patient and slower the the lesser GCS is actually will be three. Out of anything, it can't be it can't be less than three, because that's the least grade one is the thing which you give to the uh, even an unconscious patient. And then for our stroke patients, we don't rely on GCS. Then we rely on our stroke uh, stroke scale, which is NHISS stroke scales, because that is a hemiplegia. You cannot rely on the GCS. For stroke, hemorrhagic or, or an, uh, ischemic stroke, we rely on the NIHS stroke scales. So uh, coming back again, you know, we have established the breathing, we have managed the shock, we've corrected sugar, we've corrected uh, sodium, or we are in a process to correct sodium, and convulsions have been controlled. We've taken out the gastric aspiration, lavage has been done. If it was hyperthermia, we've controlled the fever. We've started the empirical treatment with proper antibiotics. We have catheterization is must in an unconscious patient to provide aspiration pneumonitis, uh, you know, as a proper protocol in the ICU. We keep our beds at 15 degrees elevation of the head end so that the patients don't have aspiration and we do give them rolling, time to time side rolling, DVT prophylaxis, physiotherapy, and conjunctival lubrication or cleansing, diaper care, all these things we need to do. This is a special care of the unconscious patient. When we mention care of the unconscious patient, all the nurses, they are supposed to be following this order that bed has to be at 15 degrees and the breathing has to be seen and the uh, patient has to be on a diaper and the catheter care needs to be done properly. So the ultimate treatment now depends upon the cause, metabolic or a structural, and the, uh, if the patient has a stroke, we need to treat it like we treat a hemorrhagic stroke or we like treat ischemic stroke. If it is an ischemic stroke, we are in the window period, then we like to do thrombolysis with any of the agents, tenecteplase or alteplase. And it may be done intra-arterially or it may be done intravenously. And patients whose coma is the result of a metabolically induced diffuse neuronal dysfunction, it involves the progression towards the hemostasis. So we've treated hypoglycemia, respiratory insufficiency, and the goal is expeditious normalization of all the values. In hypertensive encephalopathy and chronic hyponatremia, we do not correct immediately. Any disease as such, whatever disease, if it is acute, the funda is corrected acutely. If it is chronic, the correction has to be slow and not acutely because bringing an abruptness return to the normal values can be catastrophic. Thank you very much for the patient listening and I'll be glad to answer any queries.